So welcome once again to the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legend Dino, Tim Vickery, and he's in Rio, in Brazil. And he, in exalted company, is the king of nighttime radio, Dotton Adebayo, somewhere in North London. Well, I'm not at the bottom of my garden because that's a building site at the moment. The exalted company you talk of <laughs> is the Mrs. Uh, queen of Lovers Rock. Hello, everybody. Hello. And uh, that's Carol Thompson. I am Carol Thompson. Lovely to be here. And the great thing about this, Tim, is she she said before she came on this podcast, what you, you want me to join you, but I don't know anything about <laughs> football. And then I remembered, yeah, she's a gooner. Which kind of proves your point, I think. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Knows absolutely nothing about... I've got three gooners in this house with me, you know. It's not just her. It's my stepson and my lodger. Three gooners. Everywhere I turn, there's a flipping gooner. The lodger's the worst of them because he calls you lot the Israelis. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think... I think being surrounded by, by so many Arsenal fans is testament to your failure as a husband, as a yes. stepdad, and as a landlord. <laughs> as a landlord, yes. I didn't even think of myself as a landlord. Uh, he's, he, he, yeah, he's more one of the waifs and strays that my wife collects along the way. We're, we're, we're littered with them in our house. But it's true. It's actually true. true. Okay, Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. What we do, yeah. um, I'm explaining this to you, Carol, okay, and you. all other gooners there. This is uh, this offside okay, rule in yes. football. Kind you of, might know a thing or two right, about slowly, it. Yeah? Slowly, slowly. Okay, okay, I'll get, slowly. I'll get to the point. But what we do every week is yeah. look at a particular football match right. somewhere in footballing history. Okay. And today we're looking at the 1998 World Cup final. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it happened on the 12th of July, oh, uh, 1998. Yes. Do you yeah. remember much about the 12th of July, <laughs> 1998? Um, well, I know that July was a very important month for me. <laughs> for you rather than me. Yeah, yeah. You were very supportive. But um, it was more my month than it was your month. Hey, yeah, hang on a second. It's, it's, I had a little it's, bit to do it's that their month. show. It's their. I know you're going to you're going to accuse her of being a sperm bandit. I have the book, <laughs> but it's their supportive. show. Yeah, he was very supportive, and he was a very important part of of it. But that particular month for me was was quite tremendous and and, and very beautiful too. Um, the, the she mind. hasn't read the book Sperm Bandits, so please don't go into it too <laughs> technically, Tim, if you don't mind. I, I, Tim, I couldn't get past the um, the cover. No, so, you no. know, I couldn't even get past the cover to open the book, you know, that, that was just, at some point, I think I'll take a deep breath and read it, but it hasn't happened yet. And also it was the prequel that was dedicated <laughs> to her. Can I have my balls back, please? Anyway, moving swiftly on. So we're looking at the World Cup final 1998. Ooh, played football. on 12th of July, <laughs> Sunday the 12th of July, yes. between Brazil and France. Here we were, Tim, in the UK, all supporting Brazil because we knew the French wouldn't let us forget mm -hmm. that they've actually now won a World Cup. It took them 32 years after us. And we didn't let them forget for 32 years that they never won a World Cup before, unlike us. So it was a miserable day for most of us. How about over in Brazil? Well, I was, I was in England. I came back to England. I had visa problems and I came back looking for work as well. And I ended up, I broadcast the match in, uh, from BBC World Service from uh, London. And uh, it's kind of a little bit where I made my name because... If you remember, there was unbelievable hype about the Brazil side at the time, the Nike advertising thing, that wonderful airport lounge. And had that match been played in an airport lounge, I, I suspect Brazil might have won it. <laughs> On a football pitch, I could only see one result. So I remember at the start of the game, I was introduced and so on. And the line was, well, France have no chance, do they? And I said, I said well, I think France will win. If, if France are mentally strong enough, I think France, France will win. Um, the Brazil side were never as good as the hype. They, in every match against European opposition in that tournament, they struggled mightily. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think they were a team that was just ready to fall, like a, like a boxer who, uh, like, do you remember Leon Spinks when he fought Mike Tyson? 
Uh, and he's ready to fall over in a stiff breeze even before the even before the fight starts. He was and terrified thought, of Tyson. He was yes. terrified. He was <laughs> petrified of Tyson. But Brazil were not petrified of France, were they? Well, they knew it was going to be hard. I mean, as I say, every European side, they beat Scotland 2-1 in the, the first game and they needed an own goal. They lost to Norway in a group game, but still qualified. They had an almighty tussle against Denmark. The semi-final against Holland. Holland should have buried them, but couldn't. And it went to penalties and Brazil scraped through. So they're, they're at the limit every time, every time. And they had a captain and leader, Dunga, who they knew was past his best. And part of the story of the final is Dunga against Zidane, the, the, the genius in the middle of the French midfield. And Dunga couldn't catch him to throw sand at his backside. So on 3-0, Brazil were actually lucky to get away with a 3-0 with, with a defeat. The margin between the two sides was, 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 was greater. You say that, but Brazil had an excuse. At least the Brazil coach had an excuse which was uh, that Ronaldo wasn't fully fit. And he was their mm. talisman. He was. You know, I mean, you, you, you mentioned Dunga way past his best. So, and, and the Brazil side not being one of the great Brazil sides, but with Ronaldo on the pitch as a centre forward, with his speed and pace and just genius at scoring goals, there was more than hope for Brazil. You would have thought they stood a good chance of winning that match. Yeah, well, that got them through the Holland game in the in the uh, in, in the semi final, and then there's these bizarre events of the day of the final, where did he have a, a convulsion? That's the official line, isn't it? Well, no, because they went to hospital and they did tests, and apparently the tests would have shown had it been a convulsion. Something happened and it freaked everyone out. But he went to the hospital and, and had his tests and was past 100% fit to, to play and raced back to, to the ground and played. Uh, and uh, he was nothing like he'd been in the previous games, but there were far worse Brazilian players on the field that day. It's always been speculation what actually happened to him. My favourite one is, now remember, his, his knees had already given him problems. And he, he was a skinny, it's, it's hard, he's, he's often re referred to these days without any respect as fat Ronaldo to differentiate himself from, from Cristiano Ronaldo. But he was a really skinny little kid when he first came up and he bulked up. And that put a lot of pressure on his knees. And it was his knees that uh, a few times during his career gave, gave way. And his, his knees That's were in George problems. Best kind of thing, isn't it? Remember, yeah. he was really, really skinny and they gave him loads of Guinness to bulk up. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure Ronaldo likes Guinness, although I've never met a Brazilian who doesn't. When they come over, they all just, I, I think it's like tar. I don't class it as a drink. Oh. I class it as food, you know. It's dragon stout in Jamaica and they love it. You know, it's, yeah. it's a man's drink, Tim. I'm not trying to say anything, but it's a man's drink. But apparently, Guinness is really nice with, as draft. If you go to Ireland and have it as draft Guinness, it's supposed to be really nice and creamy. It's the, um, the tin that makes it taste a bit strange. But in Nigeria, they put Coca-Cola with it. You oh, know, they mix goodness. it with Coca-Cola <laughs> to make it palatable. <laughs> and there is a Nigerian Guinness, which yeah. is much stronger and but sweeter. The Irish it's is, sweeter. It's straight, straight. You yeah. know. I think oh, in Nigeria, that's really the lovely. only way they can stomach Nigerian uh, well, <laughs> jollof <jello> rice, isn't it? <laughs> jollof rice. <laughs> jollof jello rice, yeah. That's yeah. the only way they can do it. If not, they'd have to import it all from Ghana. <laughs> oh, with, uh, wow. He knows what oh, he's doing. Yeah, he knows yeah, what well he's done. doing. I know, <laughs> I know which buttons to push. He does know the buttons to push. <laughs> that was a button to push that cost me a lot of abuse on social media over the last couple of days, but I won't go into that. Um, with, but with Ronaldo, they're pumping him full of drugs, legal drugs, for his knee. And, you know, he has a history of being a sleepwalker. And I think what happened, it's the best explanation I've ever heard of what happened that morning, was he, he went sleepwalking. And if you've ever seen anyone go sleepwalking, it is absolutely it's scary. terrifying. It's scary. Yeah. And it it's freaked so everyone scary. out. Of course. And it, it, it can't have been a convulsion, apparently, because the, the test didn't show a convulsion. I think he went under the pressure of the eve of the final and with, as, a, as, a, as an effect of some of the drugs that have been, been pumped into him. I think he went sleepwalking. Yeah, I, I could buy that one. If he himself, although if he was sleepwalking, he probably wouldn't know. But if he himself <laughs> gave some indication that it wasn't a convulsion, it was something else weird, but he but looked he, out he of sorts. Said, 
He said it wasn't a convulsion. Oh, he said that. Oh, he yeah, said that. The hospital oh. tests revealed that that he had he hadn't had a convulsion. So it's always been hanging in the air. But that's the that's the best explanation that I've ever come across. Well, you know, it, it is, um, and like you say, it, I, I've I've seen somebody not so much sleepwalking, but you know, sort of like lying on the bed and then sitting up. And this was a boy, by the way. We're all sharing a tent as we were going on our way to the Danish equivalent of Glastonbury, right. just in case you were wondering. <laughs> Sorry, That's Tim. So some some <laughs> things you have to clarify. You just remember the back of your mind. Anyway, I've seen somebody like sit up in the bed right next to me and start like talking in their sleep. That was scary enough, you know. If you started walking as well, I'd have run back all the way to Stockholm. I wouldn't have been able to take it. It was it was scary. It was shit scary. If I might use some language in front of the missus, but he did look out of sorts because I think it was only about an hour before the match that he was, um, it, he, it was said that he was going to be in the in the team for that match. They had True, that they, they gave out the team sheet without him yeah. being in the match. Initially. It, yeah. And, and so then it, they- it was, put, it was all last minute. Last minute. But he didn't look himself. He looked out of sorts. So did you get that physical, um, you know, state from just sleepwalking. I don't think you do. Something else must have happened because a sleepwalker sleepwalks and then they wake up in the morning, they're normal. He wasn't normal when he woke up because when he when he went on that pitch, he didn't look like himself. He looked like something had happened to him, something you know serious had happened to him. He well, was maybe- more shocked than the rest of the players. If the rest of the players were you know, out of sorts because they'd seen him sleepwalking, fair enough. But he was the one that was out of sorts. But maybe that's the psychological thing. On the biggest day of his professional career that far, uh, instead of his usual preparation, he's rushing off to hospital and having tests and then rushing back. Maybe that, that's, that, that's got something to do with it. Because as I say, there were, there, were, there were Brazilian players in that team who played worse and they never had no convulsion. <laughs> <laughs> That is harsh, Tim. That's probably the harshest thing any footballer <laughs> could hear about themselves. OK, then. How did France win this? Zidane scored once and Emmanuel Petit that we ran into, you might remember, at Nice Airport. Yeah. The Guna. Oh, yeah, yes, you remember yes, him? Did, he yeah. scored He scored the third one, didn't he? Yeah, Zidane got two from a court, from headers, from corners. Uh, and then it was it, when it was all over as a contest because Arsenal goals, goals by Arsenal players shouldn't count in World Cup. <laughs> uh, and then Emmanuel Petit scores the last one when it's all, when it's all done and dusted. I'd say he was a good bloke when we met him and I told him straight away, look, listen, I hate the Gooners. And he was like, hmm. yeah, it's cool, no problem. Yeah, you want a selfie with me? No problem. <laughs> but then I did say to him, will you join me on my radio show? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. just, you know, just call me on this number. I never, yeah. ever got a reply. Yeah. He knew I was calling. Uh, but how did they set out? And how did the two teams set out to win this match or to lose a match? Well, Brazil's you know? main playmaker was Rivaldo. And France knew that they could mark him out of the game. I think it was Karen Burr who did a marking job on, on, on Rivaldo. He was a good player, actually. He was a good defender. Yeah, really good defender. But, well, they, they were physically strong, that French team, mm. with talent as well. And there's that lovely thing. And it, it, when we're, we're looking back on these events of like 22 years ago, it is like we're dealing with another world, isn't it? When, uh, when, no, when, when we used to say live and let live, uh, when the world was young and we used to say live and let live, because there was such optimism in the French team from a racial angle, you know, the mm. mixture of, oh, yeah. of the, the black French people, French people from Arabic origins, French people from all over mm. forming one, one team. It, it, it was, it, I think it was a lovely story. It was, it was a heartwarming story to see them achieve glory together, especially from today's perspective. Oh, I totally agree with you. And you might remember, you know, Juan Marie Le Pen saying that ain't a French team. You know, yeah, France yeah. haven't won the World Cup because he refused. He being the sort of leader of the France Nationale, the sort of racist party in uh, France. He wasn't impressed with that at all. Um, you know, as well as Karen Bo, uh, you had Liliane Thuram, whose son is doing really well now. His son might end up being a more famous player than he is. Uh, Marcel Desailly, just these yeah. names, you know, jump out at you. Some of them have played in the English leagues, uh, subsequently in the Premier League. Zinedine Zidane representing North Africa, Algeria. And there was always a sort of like um, conflicted uh, relationship between Algeria and France ever since the wars of independence and so on. Yuri Jorkov, again, uh, representing the, um, the, the Sahel region 
of uh, North Africa. And, um, you know, Patrick Vieira on the bench, shockingly. Imagine if he'd been actually on the pitch, how many more uh, France would have scored. Um, it was a multiracial team. Um, having said that, though, when you look at the uh, Brazil team, again, these are names that jump out at you and think to yourself, 3 nil. You know, people like, as well as Ronaldo, Bebeto, Leonardo, uh, Rivaldo, fair enough. But then you've got Roberto Carlos, you know, who's playing for what, Real Madrid or whatever it was yeah. at that time. And uh, the likes of Cafu were there as well. It ain't, it ain't a sort of a mugs uh, Brazil team there. It's full of really top class players, nevertheless. What I think it shows is the difficulty of retaining the World Cup because they were the champions. They'd won it in 1994. It's very hard to win it twice in a row. It's hard to stay at the top, isn't it? You know, if, if getting to the top is hard, staying on that level is, is even harder. And uh, the team as a defensive unit were never any, anything like as solid as a team that had won the tournament four years earlier. Having said all of that, having said all of that, and we've been talking football, we've left the Queen of Lovers Rock out of it. And we'll come back to your, your um, preferred field in a moment or two. <laughs> having said all of that, you mentioned... A couple of times that this Brazil team struggled against European team. What what difference does it make if it's well, a European team or non-European? Remember that this is in Europe, and the only time Brazil have ever won the World Cup in Europe is 1958 in Sweden. So it is the ultimate challenge. Um, so they were trying to do two things at once. They were trying to retain the World Cup, which hadn't happened since 58 and 62 when Brazil won those two, and they're trying to win it in Europe. Now, the two things together had never been done before. So the bar was set very, very, very high. It was, it was a really difficult thing that they were trying to do, to retain the World Cup in Europe. And uh, it was a side that went off the rails. We, we talked about this with Mark Gleeson, with the one about Nigeria winning the, uh, the, the, the Olympic gold medal two years earlier, when Nigeria beat Brazil in a, in, in a semi-final. And Brazil, at that point, they thought they had a team that was ready for 1998. And they saw when they lost to Nigeria that they weren't, they lacked leadership. And so they brought back the old captain, Dunga, knowing in the back of their minds that physically he couldn't do it anymore. So there was a, an element of self-deception going on in the, Brazilian, in the Brazilian ranks. And the task was very hard. And it was, it, was, it was an excellent French side, a really good French side, who then went on to win the, the European title two years later. So they're up against a side which was skillful, which was tactically astute and very, very strong physically. And it just proved too much. Yeah, at the time, and um, we'll return to the match. We will return to the match because there's something about the build up of the match and also the reviews about the match. Um, a lot of them focusing on Ronaldo not being really fit to play. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll return to all that. I'm fascinated uh, to talk to you about the, the the newspaper headlines on the day. As always, you know, when you go back to newspaper headlines from like 20 years ago or 22 years ago in this case, the fact that there's a World Cup happening that day doesn't feature on the front page. It's, it's just shocking. You know, it's kind of like, wait, hang on a second. The story has got to be the World Why do you think it's called the World Cup? The world is focused on this. I know England aren't playing, but nevertheless, in the British newspapers, uh, you would have thought the World Cup was some kind of like, you know, you would have thought it was like the World Series in baseball. I know nobody really takes any interest in that. When, like I said, we had skin in this game because, you know, our French friends, our, our friends in Paris were going to give us jip for the next flipping however many yeah. years. And now they've won it twice. <laughs> now they've won it twice. You can imagine how difficult it is to even go and visit them in Paris without them saying, yeah, we we, we won the World Cup two times, two, two. <laughs> two times we won the World Cup. How many times England win the World Cup? Just one time. And even that time, they didn't really score. The ball didn't go over the line. Ah, we won fair and square. So you can imagine how Britain is thinking <laughs> at this point. It's the most important game since 1966, or most important World Cup final for us since 1966. What is on the front page? Government's open door to lobbyists. So clearly this is a Tony Blair... Uh, uh, 
type of story which um, you might remember the the issue of cronyism emerge with the Tony Blair government. So Tony Blair at this point has uh, been in power for just a year because he got elected in 1997, 1998 and already the sort of um, the um, you know the, the the Damascus moment, the road to Damascus moment has started to unravel uh, because his government did this thing of you know introducing spin into our spin's always been there but introduce or turning spin into or, or, almost um you know a, a a sport in itself in as far as their government was concerned front page of the observer on the day peter mandelson remember him prince of darkness as he was known his his spin doctor was a guy called Derek draper now the reason why this is kind of um, apposite. Apposite's not the right word. At least it's now relevant and current is because Derek Draper has just come out of a coma in the last week or so, having developed coronavirus. He was one of these uh, Svengali type, uh, there were two Svengali type uh, spin doctors at the time and they represented rivals in the Labour Party so Derek Draper was one the other one was Charlie I can't remember his name he went to be the head of one of the big unions and he represented Gordon Banks so Gordon Banks and Gordon Brown Gordon Brown <laughs> I'm thinking football thank you Carol thank you I, I, I knew you know the difference because you're an Arsenal supporter but thank you for not saying anything and leaving it to Tim to correct me Gordon Brown thank you very much Tim um, and Gordon Brown and Peter Manderson are in a tussle for power in the Labour Party you know, as to be second in command uh, to Tony Blair if you like and Derek Draper was this Svengali who got into trouble twice, actually. This was the first time he'd gotten into trouble and got kicked out as a spin doctor. But basically, uh, they were alleging all sorts of things about him. And it is fascinating to see those first eight or nine pages of The Observer on the day of the World Cup of 1998 is dedicated uh, to talking about uh, the Svengali Derek Draper. And I, I've got sympathy for him. He, he married this... Um, TV presenter. She's quite a nice woman. Penny Smith, is she called Penny Smith? Penny Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah, Breakfast, yeah, Breakfast TV, TV and all of that. Yeah, I've come yeah. across her and she's really a nice woman yeah. actually. Yeah. And then they moved to Primrose Hill into a house. I used to live just on that very road they moved to. That was in 1978 when I was paying uh, 20 pounds a week uh, for a basement flat in Primrose Hill. That little basement say that, flat. That, 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 that for me is the key point. I mean, you've, you've, you've got me started now. Cause, uh, good, good, good. When I look at the shambles that, that we're in at the moment, I, I can't help blaming a lot of this on, on the Blair and the Clinton thing. Mm -hmm. I th I th Cause I, th I think that the country was just living in a dream world at this point. Incomes are not going up. They're not. There's the idea that credit will sort everything out. Mm. You can just do everything on credit, which I think puts people in, a, in an unreal space. When you remove the, the link between work and consumption, I, I think that people are, you, you're inviting people to, to move into unreality. And what was happening was, I mean, these, the, the, the Clinton thing in the States and, and the Blair thing in, in England, severing the contact with labor movements and letting the landlord class do what they want mm -hmm. so the amount of money that you're saying then you spent your 20 quid that same space now how much of how much would you be paying for that well, let me say for those who don't um, let me try and tell you it was about uh, let's say 15 square meters of living space so it was just like one room with a kitchen in the room and everything it would probably cost on that road um charcot crescent in primrose hill it'll probably cost a million pounds and for those who don't know a million pounds is probably 1.2 million dollars at the moment but we were students at the time three of us Doug Hodge, Douglas Hodge, very famous actor now, last saw him play a small part, but nevertheless a part in uh, The Joker. Do you remember when we went to yeah, see Joker? Yeah, yeah. And um, a guy called Patrick Field, who was, you know, he, he was an actor at the time. None of us really uh, made any success of acting apart from Doug 
Hodge at the time. So three of us living and we were thinking 20 quid a week was a lot of money. So we split yeah. it three ways. We were paying like seven quid each or whatever it was for it. And, and you, oh, no, you, 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 people are talking about lockdown and how it how it, it's harming jobs and biz, and biz and small businesses. If they were really concerned with jobs and small businesses, they will be saying cut rents, cut rents, stop money. Because if you've got a small, let's say you've got a small business, you work, 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 work in order to pay rent to someone who does nothing, just sits on their backside collecting. And that's what we've become, I think. That, that's what England and the States have what become. What about Brazil? What about Brazil at that time? Same, same thing happened. Same, same process happened. Who was president there? Well, under... Uh, um, first, it was a kind of social democrat, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and then Lula. Two terms of Lula and a, and a term of... of he of, was a socialist. Uh, yeah, but, again, it, and, and he made this clear. It was a kind of Blair-type thing. He made it clear. He didn't. He wasn't lying to anyone before, but he made it clear that he was going to govern inside the rules with financial capital. So one of the big things that happened again in Brazil over in the, in the the early twenty first century was rents just went whoosh. It's a champagne socialist. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, it was about capitalism at the end of the day. Yeah, the landlords of being a socialist, but they were definitely capitalists. But they were in. We're in, in a very sort of left wing camp, but they were, so, they were capitalists. And that's why we've ended up where we are today. Yeah. So says Miss Green of Lovers Rock, who at the time, <laughs> 1987, who were you touring with then? 1987, I might have been on the road maybe with Boy George, Culture Club, possibly. Boy George called up the other day. You know that, Tim? He called up the other day, so he's still in touch with Miss Green. Or wasn't I supposed to say that? You can. Called up the other day. Yeah. So you were living the champagne lifestyle. I'm, I'm, I never said socialist. No, I, no. I'm not giving away your political allegiance. I don't even know it. I don't even know it. So and, and and it's easy for you to talk about the politics, but you know I have no political opinion. Mm -hmm. So I'll carry on sitting <laughs> on the fence if you don't mind. So um, yeah. So you were touring Boy George. Yeah, maybe. I think, I think it was Boy George. Yeah, we were doing Europe. And, and were you singing? Things have got to get better. How does that go again? Things can only get better. Oh, yeah. Things can only get. Do you want to sing it? I can't remember how it goes. How's it go? Yeah, I can't remember. Either. Yeah. Well, they used to sing that all the time. That, these that champagne was, that was Blair, socialists. That was Blair's thing, wasn't it? I know. It? Yeah. yeah that champagne. Was his sort of I think it's Peter Mandelson's thing, but he thrust it upon. Oh, was Blair, that how he yeah. went? Yeah. I mean, and that that was always his opening, uh, yeah, yeah, opening yeah. sort of um, finale, wasn't Gambit, it? Not finale. Yeah, yeah. Um, celebration. One thing about about this World Cup, 1998. It's the first one with 32 teams. Mm, yeah, it's gone up from twenty four to, to thirty two. So that you get an extra African team, as I remember it, and making their World Cup debut, Jamaica. Let's go back and talk about Jamaica. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. The reggae, the, the boys. reggae boys. Well, me and the Queen of Lovers Rock, who was <laughs> at that point about eight months That's pregnant, pregnant yeah. um, went to see the reggae boys play QPR. Yeah. Uh, down in White City. And at that point, I realized the reggae boys, despite the hype, despite all the affiliation with Bob Marley and everything else who love football, as we know, were not going to win the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> I never, it was a great time. It, it was, was a great It was entertaining, that, wasn't it? Yeah, it yeah. was entertaining. What do you remember about it? I remember it being very cold, but I remember it being very entertaining. It was and in the, the summer. How could it be cold? I was cold. It was cold. In, yeah, in, yeah, that, that's a, yeah, that's a, a cold pregnant day. woman's thing, yeah. I'm afraid, because I wasn't it was, cold. It was, um, yeah, it was entertaining. I just remember they, they, were, were, they were, they just seemed to be scattered everywhere. And the, the, there wasn't any real formation. That was a problem, and it, they, they just not that they didn't look like headless chickens, but they just looked out of their league, sort of thing. They looked like the whipping boys of they the World Cup. Yeah, just, they looked like they were going to get beaten by everybody, which they were. And they didn't even get no, a draw. But no, they beat Japan. Did oh they? gosh! In the last game, I think yes. You're right. I think you're did. right. Yeah. By that time, they got it together. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I don't know what Japan were doing at the time because they're not a bad team, but maybe. I just remember sitting there, just shaking my head, just thinking, you know, not being sort of a, a football aficionado or anything, but I just sat there thinking that, that doesn't look right to me. 
<laughs> that, you know, that, that doesn't. <laughs> that our Senate yeah. taught you some better things, didn't he, by then? But I was yeah. thinking that yeah. I'm sure. Do they know what they're doing? Mm. You know, I, it was really one of those. Do you remember? There, just... there were two players on the pitch who both went on to sign for Premier League teams. One for Derby or Bolton, I think. Uh, uh, Gardner, the left back. Yeah, Gardner. He, he wasn't yeah. bad. He wasn't bad. <laughs> he, I mean, he wasn't bad for uh, Bolton, but he seemed he was their playmaker. He wasn't a left back for, or, or, sorry, for for Jamaica. He wasn't a left back. He was a midfielder uh -huh. for Jamaica. And he was the playmaker, actually. But um, I thought if he's the best player, then Jamaica yeah, in big trouble. trouble. Yeah. And the other Ricardo, there was another Ricardo who yeah. was a, he, he was a centre forward, maybe a bit. He was certainly a striker. And he wasn't as good, but he got signed to a Premier League. There was a lot of well. arguing. There, there was a lot of arguing amongst. There was a lot. Of, there was a lot of arguing. Lot of cursing amongst, amongst the spectators as well. And on the pitch. Then there was. I kid you not. This was fifty percent of the spectators were women. Can you imagine that? You go to a football match. Got nothing against it. It was like. Rah, you know, all these women there, it was amazing. And the women were doing the commentary. It was like, I, I don't know if it's a woman behind us or next to us who said, you have to pass the ball back. You have to pass the ball forward. And you know, Jamaica was passing it side to side, but not penetrating. And, and QPR won. Like they won about 2-1 or something like that. It was ridiculous. <laughs> it felt like a carnival initially yeah. because you had people yeah. whistles yeah. and, you know, it rattles. Was exciting. And Going in was exciting. And, and the noise was exciting. My father-in-law <laughs> had, this is the terrible thing. My father-in-law, as soon as, we knew that the reggae boys were in the World Cup. The whole of Jamaican Britain just it erupted. Up. Yeah, <laughs> it turned up. So my father-in-law... I, I was staying in Brixton during the World Cup. So, oh, well, yeah, right. yeah I, I remember it very well. <laughs> you would know. My father-in-law organised... Uh, my late father-in-law uh, died last year, but he organised a... Um, amongst all these uh, old-time Jamaicans at this club that he was kind of part of the people that ran old time Larry Constantine uh, club in Harlesden. He organized for a whole busload of people to go to Paris to cheer the reggae boys on. And of course, to support Brazil on the side. So I think he, he knew pretty much that the reggae boys weren't gonna win, but they had this opportunity to go and watch Brazil. So he lost on two counts. He went to, reggae boys were rubbish and Brazil lost the final. I, I vaguely know it was a Brazilian who coached the side, Hene Simoes, and I vaguely know him and I know better the fellow who was his, his assistant who took over for him and narrowly failed to get them to the next World Cup, Clovis Oliveira. Uh, and my view, and I've, I've, talking, uh, I've talked about this to people in the Jamaican FA, is that Rene did a job that was both spectacular and terrible. Oh, right. In which way spectacular, which way terrible? Well, it's spectacular because, and he got the whole country on board and he got sponsors on board. He had them, um, they, they, he set up a sponsorship deal with an airline so they could fly all, of, all around the world playing games for free, picking up experience. And he got the country really behind them and he, he, he qualified them. But then fired up a little bit with kind of religious fanaticism. He, he was telling them, we're not going to France for tourism. We're going to win. And that was just unreal. He, he in, in advertising terms, he oversold his product. You know, they weren't good enough. Actually, I don't think the results were bad when they lost the first game to Croatia, but they gave him a game and Croatia ended up third in that World Cup. So that's not bad. Argentina, it all went wrong. That's the bad game. But then they beat Japan. It's not a bad World Cup. But because he'd sold it, Rene had sold it oh, as right. a, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the view afterwards was a disappointment. So rather than a stepping stone to something else, it was, uh, what, what, what a disappointment. But I've got, I've got a question for you based really on the experience of bringing my wife over um, from, from Brazil. Uh, to London and also to Paris. And the thing that she picked up on very, very quickly was difference in the immigrant experience. She found, we, we're, going, we're going back a, a few years, this trip to Paris, this is, this is 2009, I think. And she, she, the thing that she was saying to me was, the immigrant in England seems and again, we're going, we're going back, you know, seems more integrated. Mm. Whereas the immigrant in France mm. is 
selling cigarettes on the side of the street or something like that. You know, he's, he, he seems to be an excluded from society. Uh, and uh, she picked up on that. What's your what's your views? Oh, myself. Oh, yeah, definitely. I felt that they, they were definitely marginalised in, in, in France. I don't feel that they'd actually um, been sort of embraced the way that um, most of the, the immigrant population in, in the UK have managed to get into society. And also, you know, just the whole sort of going up the social ladder. It doesn't happen so much in France. You know, social mobility in, in the UK seemed to happen, it was a lot easier, seemed a lot easier, but in Paris, definitely, they, remember they had like little areas um, where a lot of immigrants just stayed in that area and you very rarely saw immigrants in cent the center of Paris. Um, and if they were there, like you said, they were peddling or selling stuff on the side and, and always sort of looked a bit like, a, um, like, like visitors. And like they were felt very uncomfortable, like they would probably be overstaying their welcome too long if they stayed out too late. You know, they didn't seem to be part of society. They were always like just visiting into the center of, of Paris to go home afterwards. So yeah, I think your wife was correct in picking, because I picked that up as well in the early days. I think it's changing a bit now or has changed a bit now, but definitely in early days, it, there was definitely debarkation I think, definitely. I, I think, um, <clears throat> you see, it's a big question, Tim. You threw it out like it was just a, you know, an anecdote, but it's a massive, massive, massive question. Um, I would always defer uh, to, um, you know, some of the uh, more authoritative uh, philosophers on this, uh, primarily, of course, the author of, um, uh, two seminal books, uh, The Wretched of the Earth and Black Skins, White Masks. Yeah. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, we're talking about, um, what's his name? The uh, philosopher is um, Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon. Fanon. So, I, I mean, if you read Franz Fanon, he basically sets it out. Remember, France when it, the, France was the second big colonialist of Africa and it, it competed with Britain, it decided to go a slightly different route. As far as, he was con as, far as France was concerned, all these colonies were actually departements of France. So for example, today, if you go to somewhere like Martinique or mm. Guadeloupe, they are part of France. France. They're not yeah, some island in the Caribbean. They are part of France. They're département of France. When you switch on your television in Guadeloupe, you're watching French television. When the weatherman comes and says, tomorrow there's going to be snow, that's what you get in Guadeloupe. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you get in Guadeloupe. Now, you can look at it and laugh like that, but then when you go to French African countries, where they believe they're part of France, you'll see that the French have left a legacy, even though they're not they're independent countries now. So you go to Cameroon and you go to you know Cote d'Ivoire and all these places, you'll see the buildings are like French colonial brick. They're beautiful buildings. They've left infrastructure. They haven't just left a kind of like historical legacy of um, legal legacy or judiciary or something like that. <clears throat> no, they've left something different. If you go to a country like Chad today, Chad's a huge country, mostly desert, but it's got a lot of raw materials, not least uh, uranium, which we know is used in the production of nuclear weapons and so on. Who, who do you think is, when, when you come out of the airport in France, who do you think those soldiers are? They're French soldiers. Chad is an independent country, but can't defend itself from attacks, insurgencies, and so on. So the French military there are defending. Whatever you think of that, I'm just saying that the relationship mm -hmm. has always been different going back hundreds of years. What Franz Fanon says is this was um, a form of um, cultural 
uh, not just appropriation, but cultural um, enslavement that now, even now, today, the people in the French, old French colonies, they see France still as the mother country in some way. And you see all these French players, you know, conflicted or African players conflicted as to whether to play for France or whether to play for their own native countries. People like Paul Pogba, for example, still that conflict is there. Whereas the only, the only um, black players playing in England are people who are like black British. They're not people from Africa who suddenly say, oh, I'm gonna play for England because you know it's better that I play for England and get more success and things like that. And the ultimate, you are right, you, you, your missus is right, and Carol is right, that when you go to France, for example, I had this um, author, the author <coughs> of Yardi, my first uh, book that I published, became a huge bestseller, as you know. Um, his name is Victor Headley. Yeah, we pretended that he was Jamaican for years and years and years, because he was basically writing Jamaican uh, patois and writing from a Jamaican perspective. And he came to Britain and the first people he came to, he met in Britain were Jamaicans, Rastas. So he learned English, Jamaicanese or Anglo-Jamaican Rasta English is what he learned. So we pretended he was Jamaican. The reality is he's from Congo, Brazzaville. And he's mixed race, by the way, he's mixed race. His mother was white. And so he used to say to me, yeah, you know, you lot in England, and this was, this would be 1992, let's say, he'd say, yeah, you lot in England, you know, you black people in England, you don't realise how lucky you are, mate, because uh, you've got Trevor McDonald reading the news. And at that time, no black person had ever read the news on French television. Mm. And when he did, he was forced to do his uh, conscription. Uh, his military service and he said look we were treated like shit in the military when we were you know I was so glad to get out of there so he would he would give a perspective of France as being the great colonizer in this terrible place but having said that I've seen it in a much more nuanced way Carol's absolutely right when you went to France you know people going to work at nine to between nine and five they're all white people booted and suited people starting work at six o'clock in the morning were all Africans or whatever that's when you see Africans in the center of town who are actually going to work rather than peddling or uh, trying to you know juggle mm. one way or another but they'd be gone but but things are changed yeah, but, things are, but it's yeah. not it's not dissimilar to the UK mm. you go I work till five o'clock in the morning when I'm driving home who yeah. do you think I'm seeing going yeah. to work at five o'clock in the morning mm. it, it, if it's not if they're not black I can bet they're Eastern European mm. yeah. I can't see English people going to work at five o'clock in the morning mm. And when you talked about people living in different areas, that's just yeah. what happened here. It was ghettoized. It's just we've evolved in a different way. I, I generally don't know which was the better colonialist, if I can put it that way. I genuinely don't mm. know. I think they have their systems. I'm used to the English way. And I can see your missus seeing it from the outside and mm. saying, oh, yeah, but there. But the French go through their struggles. They are changing. And there are different perspectives. I've seen more French black French people in the countryside in France living there right. than I've seen in Britain. If you see what I mean. Yeah. It's only when I go to Jamaica, that I think in Jamaica, you see black people in the countryside everywhere. You know, you're driving down a road in Jamaica and it looks like Cornwall, <laughs> except <laughs> just full of black people. Yeah. And you're thinking, what the hell? Then you remember back home, you never see that. Whereas in France, you go to the countryside, you do see black people. Interesting. Make of it what you want. Mm. Should we look at the charts from the 12th of July, 1998? Um, some interesting tunes there. Number one, Jamiroquai. I'm sure you approve, Mr. Vickery. You're the biggest critic of the charts from the old days, especially when they go kind of like poppy. Yeah, I mean, um, I was surprised actually looking at, at these charts because I expected it to be all Britpop. And it, it, it kind of isn't at all, is it? No, there's, what not. there is, is I mean, success breeds imitators. And there's lots of Spice Girls wannabes. Yeah, uh, Bewitched. I remember there were like five girls from 
Island. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. do you remember that was their one hit, C'est oh, la vie. Yeah. C'est la vie, c'est la vie, or something like something that. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, one, the one, they, didn't, they didn't survive, did they? They didn't survive. No. I, I think some of them might have been sisters. It might have all oh, been, right. or something okay. like that. Yeah, that's the only Spice Girl imitator in the charts. Although Billy, whatever happened to her, she's yeah, turned into Billy Piper. She's quite, she's quite a, a successful actress, actually. Yeah, she's yeah. Quite, yeah she's Although she's well. she's married to that um, the son of uh, what's his name that was in the Day of the Jackal. Um, she's married to uh, another actor. Yeah, but okay. he keeps coming out with all sorts of nonsense. Was she know. married to that that fox? Yeah, yeah, person. yeah. The fox, the younger fox, not Edward Fox, obviously, right. but the younger right. fox. And he keeps coming out with some foolish stuff about uh, Matt Lives Matters Matt. and stuff yeah. like that. I, I, I don't know, I mean, how she can sort of like be in that relationship, because he just needs to keep his gob shut. He doesn't understand <laughs> Black Lives Matter. Keep your gob shut and keep acting. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're begging him to sort of make a comment that, oh, well, all lives matter. Well, what about white lives matter or whatever? <laughs> he keeps doing that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Then you think, well, stuff you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or maybe she's in that relationship because she wants to, because she wants to. And if she does want to, <laughs> then um, then I think that's a mark against her, quite frankly. Yeah, because we want to, because we want to. Okay, Save Tonight by Eagle Eyed Cherry was uh, one tune there. You know, Eagle Eyed Cherry is the sister of, and uh, brother of Nanny Nen Cherry. Cherry. And also, importantly, the son of Don Cherry. And um, you'd say he's a half-sister to... Half, well, half brother to Nanny <laughs> Cherry. His father, he, uh, Don Cherry, the great jazz trumpeter. Did I, did I, have I told you about my story with Don Cherry? Uh, no, no, because this is a Sweden story almost. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> yeah. It's a Sweden story and it's a Denmark story and it's an Ian Dury story because there's like two or three stories going on here. Hit me with your rhythm stick. <laughs> okay, let me hit you with the rhythm stick. I have to start from the first one. Um, I, I produced a band in Sweden and the cheapest place to record was down in the south of Sweden, like 800 miles from Stockholm. So we had to take an overnight train to get there. And here's, here's what you do for your craft. I can't afford to be in the sleeper car. The rest of the band take the sleeper car. All the money I've got is for them to be in the sleeper car. I'm sitting on a normal flipping seat and the, the train stops at a place called Hessler Holm about five o'clock in the morning. Nobody else in the platform. And the trains, they're going to sort of like, half of the train is going to be uncoupled. So I have to actually get up and move my carriage. The people in the sleeper car, the rest of the band, they're okay. So I get out onto the platform, deserted platform in Hesley Holm, stretch my legs. And this black dude came, come, just comes up out of nowhere, you know, looking really cool, slim, tall black dude. He said, hey man, talking in American accent, hey man, are you the dude I'm supposed to meet from the train from Stockholm? And I said, well, I am on the train from Stockholm, but no, I'm not the dude. And he goes, okay. And he disappears. I never see him again. I'm thinking to myself, I recognize that face. And it takes me probably about a day to realize, that was Don Cherry. That was, oh my word, that was Don Cherry. And Hesley Home makes sense because Nanny Cherry's mum, who he's together with, lived in Hesley Home or near outside a place called Hervik, I think it was, just outside Hesley Home, where a lot of sort of artists and stuff lived. So after that, the next time I see him um, is at the, I already mentioned the sort of Danish equivalent of Glastonbury, which is um, Rothschild. Roskilde, Roskilde, yeah. Roskilde. And uh, um, Ian Dury's on stage on a Sunday morning, and I know Ian Dury and all these guys anyway, and I'm, I'm on the side of the stage, you know, and Ian Dury's doing, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll, hit me with your rhythm sticks, one of the biggies, <laughs> and um, Don Cherry's on stage with him. Don Cherry recognized, turns over and recognizes me, and he's like this, and he's like, come on, come on, come on the stage. And I was like, really? Okay, then I come on the stage. And Ian Dury then sees me rushing on the stage, or, you know, siding onto the stage. And he's like, come on, come to the center <laughs> of the stage. And I literally, there's like 50,000 people in front of me. I don't know why. When I get the old thumbs up from Ian Dury, I've never been able to do it since. I do a cartwheel. I do, I literally do a cartwheel onto the stage. It's just complete adrenaline. And I get onto the stage. True story, true story. Um, I've got a photograph from it 
have I got a no no I've got a photograph from another time on the main stage at Ross Kildee, not from that one but uh, yeah it was amazing anyway that's Eagle Eye Cherry <laughs> I've interviewed him subsequently that is his one big hit it was a big hit for him actually so but that's not a bad track you like that track did you say it's, it's it's mainstream it surprised me actually from him I expected something a bit more a bit more edgy no, but if you think that he's Nene Cherry's brother, and there was a, a third sibling called Tatio, um, much bigger in Sweden than Nene Cherry or Eagle Eye, but never seemed to be able to break overseas. You know, they're all going towards a pop road. You know, Nene mm. Cherry was always pop. Mm. Uh, and her daughter's yeah. pop now as well. She's got a daughter. And she's got a daughter as her well. I didn't even know about it. Called Mabel, and she's, okay. she's had like a series of number one hits as well. Really? Here in the UK. Is it her daughter, Mabel? Yeah, Mabel's her daughter. Yeah, she's got the one name, Mabel. Yeah, she that's her daughter. A... Is it her daughter? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't she, know that. she called her kid Tyson, didn't she? Yes, yes. And Which... there was a daughter as well, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't she's... know. She's I think it was a girl yeah. called Tyson, yeah. yeah. In retrospect, that might not have been a wise choice. <laughs> well, you don't know which Tyson she was referring to. I do, yeah. Well, she talked about Mike's strength and so yeah. on you know he's coming back isn't he he's, he's got he another match yeah him. well he hasn't gone away everybody wants to fight him but i'm not yeah. sure that they'll get much out of that and then peter andre is there do you want to do you want to brave about him no no, no. bland 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 <laughs> I think you would i think you would uh freak me by another level where are they now do you remember yeah, another they, level vaguely, all these it's, rubbish it's one fans off, one off it's, like, it's, it's, it's almost soft porn isn't it <laughs> it's terrible it's terrible <laughs> i've got to give a little bit of a shout for ace of bass who all was kind of like a they were trying, swedish yeah. reggae kind of thing yeah, two yeah. sisters yeah. She wants. Well, yeah yeah that wasn't their bigger one no. life is a flower no. i can't remember that no. but ghetto superstar by prayers yeah. prayers from it, Refugee, that, that takes Refugee. islands in the stream by kenny rogers and oh, puts right. it in a totally different context but it's not bad though you know and no, it was in that movie wasn't it it was in that movie with, um, uh, what's his name? I can see the movie now. It's kind of like, um, well, um, what's her name's in it? Um, what's her name? Who was Catwoman? You know, she's a mixed Michelle race. Pfeiffer? No, 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 the original. Oh, Halle Berry. Hey, Halle Berry. Halle Berry. Halle Berry is in that film right. that uh, get superstars from. Uh, that, that's the one for me in the charts. Of that. I mean, Jamiroquai, Deeper Underground, yeah, it's all right. John Travolta. Well, that's the one that's lasted the longest. Out of all these tunes, the ones that survived is, yeah. um, you know, yeah. interestingly, ironically, John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John, which should have been a throwaway song from the film Grease, but actually is the one that has managed to survive all these yeah. years. Yeah. You know? I like um, that Brandy and Monica thing. The, the, boy, the, is the boy is mine. That kind of it, that, yeah. that that kind of floating ethereal R and B that was that was that was all the all, all the vogue at the time. I, I like that. I think it's I think it's well done. I'm going to go for you're the one that I want. John Travolta and Olivia Newton John. Can you sing it? <laughs> Can you sing it? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, you're the one that I want. You're the really one I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You're the one that I want. You're the one that one I want. Oh, so I can remember the, I don't remember this song. I can only remember the chorus. Do you remember the chorus? Uh, no, I've but I do. Oh, something. well done. Is that the one? Well done. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're multiplying. They're multiplying. That's it. And I'm losing control. Mm, you should make a living. Because the power <laughs> you're supplying. It's electrifying, <laughs> but you're not going to be John Travolta. Yes, I am. Uh, no, no, uh, no, yes, no, no, no. Yes, yes, <laughs> no, you're not the one I want right now. <laughs> How about let you? him, let him be an Afro-Saxon John Travolta. He's always dreamt of it. <laughs> How about the you better shape up there? You better shape up. Well, I think he has. You know, <laughs> he compared has to what, what he was no, he two or three years ago. You know, he, he is half the man he used to be. Yeah. <laughs> not half. Not half. Three quarters. <laughs> not half. Not certainly for half. He's half the man, but, okay, more, but, but more the man. Okay. Are you going to... You better shape up. Because <laughs> I need a man. <laughs> my heart is set on you. Mm. You better shape up. You better understand. <laughs> I should say. To my heart, I must be true. To my heart, I must be true. You're the one that I want. Da, 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 da. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I 
<laughs> she didn't know before I asked her that she was going to sing on this podcast. Honestly, he just throws me like, uh, uh, that, that reminded me a little bit. There's a story of that Rod Stewart tells in his autobiography, not too yeah. many years ago, right. when he was he was had to undergo a serious, really serious operation. Right. So before he's sitting in the waiting room with his, you know, on his with his headphones, listening to Sam Cooke, and why oh, not? You know? Yeah, that's the and only and, the and he's singing yeah. along. Yeah, singing along, and uh, the the uh, the hospital receptionist for some reason didn't know who he was. Okay, didn't and, know who uh, Rod Stewart was or something. Yeah, yeah. Was. and, and, and said, was. said said to his assistant, "He's not bad. He's he's, he's not bad, is he?" <laughs> and and his assistant said, "Yeah, we ho we hope he's going to take it up professionally one day." <laughs> Yeah, he was a serious <laughs> Sam Cooke fan, wasn't he? Yes, he was, yeah, yeah, and, that's his and hero. so am I. And yeah, uh, and I'm a huge fan. I think of he was I'm a so Sam sorry Cook and well. Otis, Otis Redding yeah. fan. Yeah, did he? you hear what he just said? What was that, Mr. You, you know that Tim is one of your biggest fans. Probably. Well, I love. I'm. I'm so sorry. I think it's just. A, it's just. It's. It's just perfect. Oh wow! And I, I want to know if you yeah. ever, if you'd ever heard the version that the Mint Juleps did. I did. They they um they got in touch with me. It might have been in the eighties, I think. That's it. I, I, yeah. I saw them in eighty four. Right. Supporting Sister Sledge of all things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, th th they they did. They did their version because they got in touch with art. Yeah. Say it's it just okay. beautiful a, a cappella yeah, version. Acapella and version. I, I always remember this because they said to the audience, "This is I think this is in the, the Dominion, Tottenham Court Road." Right. They said the. You know what lovers rock is, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, and uh, and then I said, yeah, we just we just did a gig at Portsmouth. They never heard of it there. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Amazing. Well, oh wow! Look at up. that. I didn't know you were a fan, Tim. Wow. No, I love her. I, I love him. So Tim sorry. is your biggest fan record. in Brazil. By the way, I need to come to Brazil. I need she, to. Need she's to... already booked for a gig in another gig in Argentina next year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It, but I haven't been to Brazil yet. But I know that. But they love Tim it, goes to it. Argentina every week. Oh, you know, do you? When, well, yeah, when before incredible. the lockdown, I was. Before I was the, going oh, there. Right. Yeah. Frequently. I've got the, there's, a, there's a big. There's a big ski band. Um, Called, it's Hugo. I don't remember. Blue the, Moon. Were they, I, no, they so, weren't Blue Moon. I okay. can't remember the name, but his his name is Hugo, and he plays uh -huh. the, the the trumpet. Mm. And um, yeah, we have we work together. We collaborate from time to time. So we go. I go over to to um, Argentina. But how, I'm looking how, forward to coming to Brazil though at some point. How proud are you of the way that reggae has permeated the world? It, I'm just. I think it's just beautiful. It's just an amazing thing. I, it, everywhere you go, it's it's a music that people understand and they feel it and it just seems to make people happy and it's just it's an it's just one of those genres that just keeps giving doesn't it it just keeps giving all the time and um yeah it's one little island in the caribbean <laughs> and it's everywhere it's everywhere all different versions of reggae every country they do their own their own version of of a reggae song and their own type of reggae too so you can Mix and, mix and match reggae music, can't you? You can add mm. Latin, jazz, pop, funk. It's amazing, actually, when you when you do think, when you analyze it. Was it was Kate Garraway that right. Derek Draper married, not oh, Penny okay. Smith, so I apologize. To Penny Smith. Wasn't, I apologize to Penny <laughs> Smith, apologize to Kate Garraway. Just came to my mind oh, now. Right. Uh, yeah, apologize, but... apologize, apologize, apologize. Uh, forgiven. Going back to that Derek Draper conversation. By the way, no, what I should say is, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Oh, didn't mean to get it wrong. I didn't, didn't mean, mean to, to get, get it wrong. Okay. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh my god, completely. Was that the song you were talking about? Completely wrecked my song. No, well, you can you can, you, can, you can do the honors. I'll sing this one for you. I'm so sorry. Ooh. I didn't mean to make you cry. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to make you blue. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. No, this one's for you. Except too. it wasn't written for me. <laughs> this is yeah. Written for <laughs> yeah, I know, but it wasn't yeah. written. She wasn't saying sorry to me. Let me just make that clear, right. you know, you know. <laughs> Just make that but, clear. But isn't this fascinating? Because you, you were talking about black people in 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 rural environments. 
Mm. And a lot of the Jamaican diaspora, they were from rural areas. Yeah, they? yeah. In fact, Coming to the big city. And what happens with these Jamaicans in the big city? It's good they come up with Lover's Rock. Oh, that's different, though. Lover's Rock is different. But you're absolutely right, 100%. The greats of reggae, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Burning Spear, all of them came from the countryside. Yeah. There would be nothing. Bob Marley would say, no, I mean, love the country, man, where I come from. People say, good morning. Mm -hmm. Good morning, sir, you know, <laughs> compared to the city. The thing about Lover's Rock, remember, we are the second generation of Black British people. Our parents came here to work. The work was in the city. Remember, no blacks in the countryside in the UK. The, the, the work was in the city. So the children grew up certainly getting a little bit of, and most of them came from the countryside, certainly it, it, from the Caribbean. They weren't people from Kingston coming to the UK. They had jobs. It was people from Trelawney or from St. Anne's or from wherever in the countryside coming to the UK and uh, not just in, from Jamaica, but all over the Caribbean, coming to the UK. In fact, the Caribbean was like a one big countryside in those days because, mm. you know, city, Kingston was very small. And they came to the UK and brought a little bit of their culture with them. And their second generation, their children, were brought up, weaned on this sort of music from the Caribbean. And then they did something else with it. So when you get bands like Steel Pulse, they're from the city of Handsworth, Matumbi, they're from the city of yeah. London, for South London to be precise, mm. and Lover's Rock, although Miss Lover's Rock, Queen of Lover's Rock, Carol Thompson, comes from Hitchin in Hertfordshire, which is just down the road from where you grew up in the country, right. isn't it? Where did you grow up? Hemel Hempstead. Yeah, I grew up in Letchworth. Right, yeah, it's the same place, it's same like place. 1950s concrete which is falling down. Stevenage and all those places. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. Right. And, and, and you may have come across Miss Queen of Lovers Rock mm. on your travels. Tell me, who was she seeing in those days that she sang I'm So, she wrote, I'm so Sorry for? Do you know? Let it slide. It's gone. Oh, oh, man. It slide. That is never going to slide. As it, someone said to me the other day, yeah, but now when she sings it, she's singing it for you. That's right, darling. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, you try to get out of that one. Look, we've, we've, a... we've, we've both got stepdaughters. You've got yeah. to let it slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a stepson. I'd rather have stepdaughters, yeah. you know, but I shouldn't say that. Really. Say that. No, I'm happy to have a stepson. Did you, just, did you just kick me in the nuts? Then? You just kicked me in the nuts. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, must engage think, the brain. Oh! Engage the brain before you open the mouth. Well, well, well. <laughs> all I want to say is your life is easier than you think it is, Tim. That's what I'll say on that. He has two daughters that keep him under control anyway, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's very true. But still, there you go. Listen, it's been a fascinating one. 1998, do people in Brazil still think about the way they lost that World Cup final. Is yeah, they do. Point? Although four years later they won and Ronaldo came back. It's one of the most heartwarming yeah. stories. You know, yeah. he almost climbed off his off his uh, off his injury you know bed with another knee injury that people thought had ended his career. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with the aid of that mad little haircut, do you remember that strange I haircut remember. he had? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. was that was because he was feeling the knee again, mm -hmm. and he wanted something for the it's media distract. to talk about that wasn't his knee. So he'll have a, he had this strange little haircut. So it all, it all had a happy ending. If you've got to lose one in order to win one. Yeah. Well, that was that. just a blip, wasn't it? It was a yeah. blip. Just a blip. Did he enjoy the croissants <laughs> anyway? Did he enjoy the croissants? Uh, what, in France? Yeah, you, you go to France, you've got to eat a croissant. You do, you do. I've got, I've got happy memories. I haven't been back since 2009, but I've got good. Wow. How can they do something so sensational with bread? But do, do you know how hard it is? I'm trying to make one now. I've, I've got the missus to get me all the yeast and everything like that. I'm, I've looked up how to cook it, you know, and it takes days to make a croissant. Can you believe that? Yeah, it's uh -huh. quite the French it's an art. But the French, they love their arts. You're absolutely right. And you said to me once, you know, the difference between French, like street furniture and British street furniture is that the French make street furniture and furniture in general, mm -hmm that looks beautiful whereas yeah. we make it to last forever it just, it's yeah. functional yeah, yeah. Ours is functional but ours, ours is functional ours is built to last but, but with style and some kind of you know, yeah 
small towns in France are gorgeous, aren't they? And small Beautiful. towns in England, you know, you get outside London, you think, why on earth? Why? Grim. What, grim. You know, what am I doing here? It's grim. There's some of the places outside yeah. in London are okay. Why some do you the think small they call villages. it Grimsby? No. <laughs> why do you think they call it that? You know? Some places are quite cute and quaint. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, once you start getting to rich people's territory, like in the Cotswolds <laughs> and things like that, where you will not see any you know colored people <laughs> i hasten to add yeah. quote unquote yeah. or poor people mm -hmm. that's where you start getting yeah. pretty you know when the villages in the villages every house costs a million plus yeah that's when it starts getting pretty mm -hmm. uh, and you don't see riffraff you don't see gutter snipe <laughs> but apart from that what is left for gutter snipe and riffraff is grimsby not milton any, keynes not, yeah milton keynes sorry apologies to everybody in grimsby change that let me talk about milton keynes somewhere that you guys know very well from hertfordshire i think that i think we're done you happy yeah yeah no, you happy tim i don't know anything about football but i know a lot about you and tim yeah yeah and and and, and, and you know how well i can sing well i knew that a wop bop a loom up a lot bam boom <laughs>